Welcome to the Braemar Life Skills Academy podcast. The world is changing faster than ever, and the world of education is too. Advances in psychology, biology, and a whole range of other fields have opened up new lines of thought about the purpose of school and how it can best serve a new generation of students. Join me on the Braemar Life Skills Academy podcast every week to explore these new ideas. Last week, I had a great time talking to Chef Shay Mandel. Shay is the founder behind Rooks to Cooks, a children's cooking education program, and she talked to me all about the place of cooking and nutrition in the lives of children. In today's podcast, I'll be speaking to Maria Solikovsky, the founder and visionary behind Wild by Nature Homestead. Welcome back. Another episode of the Braemar Life Skills Academy podcast. My name is Mike Helsby. I'm the director of student experience here at Braemar College, and we are thrilled to have in studio, live and in action with us today, Mrs. Maria Solikovsky. Maria, thanks for being with us. Thank you, Mike. Maria is the founder and visionary of Wild by Nature, an urban homestead that encompasses mentoring programs, herbal workshops, and a herbal apothecary. She is the matriarch, magician, and mentor. I've seen this uh, up close and personal throughout the past uh, growing season. Maria is inspired by everything herbal, sustainable gardening practices, community building, self-sufficiency, and homesteading in the city. We're going to learn a lot more about some of that terminology later in this episode. She emphasizes nature connection as a pathway to lifelong learning and to live the life our wild nature longs for. There are like 20 things in that introduction that I want to jump right in and ask you about, but I'm going to give you the open space just to tell the folks at home a little bit more about yourself and, and how you've come to be with us here today. I'm just interested in the question of what is my relationship to education? And I think that education is a lifelong process. I don't think that it's something that that you go to school and then it ends and then it's, it's done. Yeah. So I, I believe that nature is a great teacher. It's my favorite teacher. Um, try to make all of my learning based around nature. And it offers a place for me to reflect and reflect who I am in relationship. So in relationship to myself, to place, and to the greater community of our human species and the planet and Mm -hmm. our impact on it. And I find that reflective tool very, very helpful, um, very insightful for valuable learning that that I've continued for my life. I also was a nerd in school. I was part of the gifted program. And as part of that, we got to do a lot of deep dives into independent studies of things that we found interesting. And we got to go off the main path of what our curriculum was from a very young age. So from, from grade six, grade seven. So that was always very helpful for me. I'm extremely curious as a human and being able to go into a deep dive on any subject that I felt interested in or guide my learning was encouraged for me from a very young age. So Mm. that's definitely, I think it influenced my method of learning, but also was the right fit for the appropriate method of learning that I have. Um, and especially things that I can't learn in books, which are abundant. Mm-hmm. There, there, I think there are very few things that you can learn in books. And I read a lot, and I love books, and I love reference books. But I really believe in the value of hands-on experience and experiential learning and submersive learning. So I just found from a very young age that my passion for learning, like, exceeds the classroom yeah. and it, it was bigger than what the classroom could offer me so I didn't go to university or college I went to specialized schools to learn the things that I was particularly interested in and I've had a lot of mentors along the way did you have a, a sense even early on that um, the what you described as the the main path or the beaten path wasn't necessarily for you that that sort of classical trajectory from, let's say, AP high school into university, into the job market. Were, were, were there any influences in your life that kind of made you think, oh, there's there's a lot of divergent paths that I might take here and more deep learning, maybe more holistic learning to be done? Was that, Do you remember a, a sort of seminal moment in your childhood where that happened? Um, I, 
I don't know that I had like you'll find as we talk through this interview there aren't a lot of aha moments things are happening more organically and through unraveling of things and disillusion of other things Mm. um, rather than oh this is the moment and then I have to make a full change in my direction of my trajectory and I think I, I remember clearly feeling in high school just extremely stressed out about the weight of my decisions and going to school and what was it at, and I was a year younger than everyone um, graduating so I was 17 having to make these decisions and I was not ready to make those decisions it's not that I wasn't ready to leave home I wasn't ready to decide what I wanted to do with the rest of my life and I I ended up moving to another town that my brother had was in Waterloo, Kitchener Waterloo, going to university. He was in architecture school, and I decided that I would go and live in that town for a few months when I graduated high school, so that I could decide what did I want to do. And I would go and sit in in his architecture lectures, which was a lot of fun. Um, but then I met someone who was my first love, and we m- moved to British Columbia together. And I I realized very quickly in that trip that me improvising my path and discovering as I was going was something that was very much in my comfort zone, Mm -hmm. which is obviously not for everybody. And I'm not a super traveler. I don't love traveling. I, I really do enjoy making plans and setting goals and working towards them. In terms of Um, my education and how it started for me to go into the world to learn who I was and what I wanted. I just had to get on a bus and travel (laughs) across the country to do it. And so, yeah, I I think though the, the adventurousness may be a bit more pronounced in your background in your life. um, The discovery that the things learned at that period are mostly learned outside the classroom is I think almost a universal discovery. It's something that we, maybe get into our late 20s, early 30s, and uh, we look back and we say the the social aspect, especially the socialization that happened during those years was far more important to us at that time and far more transformative than the material that was sort of sent down to us from our instructors in the classroom. Yeah, absolutely. And as a mom Mm -hmm. now, I have a a 10-year-old daughter, she, watching her learning and through COVID and how schools changed and, and I'll talk about that later, but that really clearly indicated how important the social aspect of school was and maybe the most important aspect of school yeah. for, from our perspective. I think, I think the, the yeah. studies that are coming out in response to those two years of, of radically revised education models um, yeah. is pointing in exactly that de- direction. We can catch up some yeah. of the subject knowledge. You can't catch up the socialization. It's, yeah. it's, it's so formative. Exactly. Um, your role as, as an educator is, you, you've described it, and I, I would say this um, has been my experience with you as well, is, is as a mentor. Um, mm. and, and you've developed this mentorship community um, with this, this homestead setting um, that you crafted alongside your family. So correct me if I'm wrong. Um, the history, as I understand it, is that about eight years ago, yourself and your partner and your daughter uh, made a move to a, a residential property in East Toronto, which at the time I don't think would have been described as a as a garden homestead. Um, no, no, it was it was a lawn and a, and a driveway. And it, it wasn't quite a lawn. They did have a garden. They had a lot of great plants. They were just all in the wrong place, okay. uh, and yeah. none of them were edible or useful. They were all ornamental, but mm. it, it was beyond just a lawn. Um, but yes. A lot of driveway, very suburban. Yeah. And, and I, I've spent enough time at this uh, at this garden, as have many of our Braemar students, that I, I can see in my mind what a massive transformation you've enacted there. But I want to stay focused on the, the idea of this sort of adventurous transition for a moment, because you've, mm-hmm. d- you've described uh, you got out of high school and you knew that you were doing your learning in, in a different along a different avenue than perhaps our society would prescribe for most people. This You made this big jump out to B.C., and in my experience getting to know you, it seems like that's something you've continued to embrace, this the jump, right? And so you and your, your partner and, and your family jumped to this, this place, and you've shown me pictures of what it was like, and I know what it's like now. 
Can you describe especially the initial feelings of that transition and, and just what you've learned, what you've taken from the, the last several years of turning your property into uh, an organic and integrated part of the, of the natural ecosystem around it? So maybe just a little background first. By all means. Um, I, didn't, I didn't know that I wanted to homestead in the city. That became a very strong urge in me once I became a mom. This, uh, I felt like my life before I, my daughter was born was that it was 20% predictability, which was my home in Kensington Market, where mm. I lived for 13 years and I gardened every little inch of it. Um, and 80% unpredictability, like improvising, improvising my life. What is the next thing that I'm going to create and bring to the world that's going to make me feel good about creation and connection and giving my gift to the world? And I was really involved with food and local food. And I, I was running a catering business. I had a restaurant, like a speak eatery in Kensington in our home. Cool. And... So strangers would come together and gather around the table every Sunday night and and I would bring them a fixed course meal and I would describe where all these ingredients came from. Some of them came from our garden. They all came from local farmers and I told stories and there was a whole education element to me serving food to people. And as people started to be really interested as we were eating outside in the garden, Hey, what is that growing? And can I can I help you harvest this? And I I started to become disillusioned with just serving people an experience. There's something there is an embodiment that happens when you're eating food, but it wasn't enough for me. And I just remember after a really busy catering season, just feeling like sitting on the floor in my kitchen, saying, "I'm." I'm done with this. Mm. I don't want to do this anymore. Like I need to have something more to give to people and they want to know more about where their food is coming from. And that was really why I was feeding people to teach people about local food, about the importance of being part of your ecosystem and your community and contributing to it and how you could contribute to it. And I started with things like foraging in the laneways of this neighborhood Mm. and leading tours or um, making partnerships with local schools to run programs for their kids or youth. And I worked at the High Park Children's Garden, and that really infused in me this, I have to build teaching gardens everywhere <laughs> in the city kind of a feeling. And it was really, really rewarding for a lot of years And I got to see all of Toronto in so many different neighborhoods and communities, um, very different perspectives with every single community center that had a garden. In in some areas, it was very aesthetic. In other areas, it was very part, like part of their food security. And, but I did feel working in a meta structure, which I will often see this, is that the needs of the individuals aren't being met because in order to have a meta structure, you've got to have some parameters and guidelines of how these things work. And then you end up missing out on all the little details. Hmm. And I thought I want to do this on my own. And when, when we, I left the house in Kensington and we moved to a tiny little condo, like a loft and there was no green space. And after the first year, I had eight steps up to my entrance of our loft. I had 16 pots plus the outside. Then the neighbor said, you can put pots on my steps. Then I joined the condo board so I could deal with the garden around the place and then found a park down the street that I could build a garden in and made a huge project happen. I, I just, no matter where I went, I could see that I had to grow in the community and I wanted to share growing things and building gardens and having community gather in garden to learn to support to create together and I I just kept finding limitations working in city parks and working with other big um, like not industry but with other 
with other organizations that were very large, like the city and Toronto District School Board. Yeah. And so I decided when we saw this place for sale, we thought, if we move here, we're never going to leave. Like, this is the place. I'm not going to leave the city. I didn't have my driver's license at that point. I do now, but that's very new. And I just knew that that was a, a place that we could stay and really grow into and not feel limited by, by is this, are we going to outgrow this place? Like, am I going to have to transplant myself into a bigger place? And it's not so big that it's unmanageable, no. but there, it's big enough and it's unique enough in its shape that it really has so much potential. And I think because of the way my creative, visionary self works, that I don't see limitations there. I, when I have a limitation or I only have a few ingredients, that instills this, like, inspires this creativity in me, which then says, how can I solve this problem? I have this limited ingredients. How, what can I make? What magic can I make with this? So I feel like that with this house, that when we moved there at first, it was part of us saying, are we moving to the boonies? Because mm. like, we had always lived downtown. Yeah. And... And now I, I, wow, what a struggle it was to come downtown. Like, I feel like I'm coming into a whole other world, right? Yeah. I started a, a different, quieter place. So just going back to reference that once Sophia was born, I think I switched my priorities to be, I mean, this is just a metaphor, but 80% certainty and 20% uncertainty. I and I, I say a metaphor because there is no certainty except for that change mm. will happen. So... But the emphasis on our life and our rhythm in our home and making a homestead has made such a solid foundation for us that I see growth from all of us in our family that would not have been possible if we had been moving around or if we hadn't been rooted in place. And that is really powerful. And that's what I want to be sharing with people why I open our home and our garden to other people to be able to come and experience that because not everyone is willing to make that commitment to invest, not just like financially invest or able to, um, but time and the resource of your energy to put into a place. And every year that we build there, it's it just makes me more deeply rooted and makes me feel like really, I'm really, really never going to leave this place. Yeah. I mean, you can't predict what's going to happen in the future, but in terms of how I can bring this to a wider scope of people for other people to be able to experience what we'll talk about, um, they can experience there is I mean, for me, that's the biggest gift of this place. It just feels like there, when we went to this homestead, that we invested in a lot of natural resources. So I feel very, very wealthy, even though I live very small. Mm. Do you know what I mean? I do. Yeah. We have a I tiny do. little house. We we rent half of the house. Like, we, we didn't have a car for... I'm almost 50 and you know like I just got my driver's license like things are very very small for us in terms of what we need to consume from outside and that changes a lot about what how it is you interact with your environment and that's the basis for our learning hmm. in my perspective is how it is you're interacting with your environment we are so this is a whole other conversation but we are so distracted by consumption that it really pulls away from what is possible and what's possible for you to create yeah. and put out. I'm so glad you, that you yeah. turned in that direction. And, and you're right. I want to talk to you more about the, the ins and outs and the details of homesteading and, and what we might expect to get if, from an educational standpoint in gardening. Mm. But there's a, an undeniable connection here, I think, that needs to be made with our Let's, let's say society's mental health. I, 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 we usually focus on teenagers and, and students in, on this podcast. But over the last few years, the, the terms detachment, 
disassociation, disconnection, specialization, linearity, mater materialism, consumerism. I, I don't know if I'm just paying more attention to them, but they've just seemed to pr proliferate in everybody's consciousness. Like there's this real pressing sense, at least here in downtown Toronto, that we are more disconnected from the terms of our life than is sustainable. Right? As, as you said, you use the phrase distracted by consumerism, and I think that's, that's absolutely spot on. For the better part of my life, I didn't even, I didn't even think to think of where my food was coming from, right? I didn't think to think of what my carbon footprint was, right? Or, or about what the, even the, the decisions in my life that I was making in terms of my, my identity presentation, mm -hmm. right? It wasn't, I wasn't referring to me and to my, my natural instincts and to, to my real emotional needs. I was referring to the performed needs that I was seeing on television and that I was perceiving partially in the, in the lives of those around me. Mm -hmm. And it's taken people like you and experiences like being in your garden and meeting a whole bunch of other people, thank goodness, who, who share this spirit, even just to make me aware of this absence in my life, not mm -hmm. necessarily to solve the absence, but just to make me aware of how, how much of me is detached mm -hmm. from, from the real foundational, you've, you've said roots several times. It's interesting to me that the metaphor of gardening appears so much when you describe your lifestyle. And, oh. and your humanness, right? Uh, Which absolutely, is, it's, it's no surprise, yeah. but it is, in some senses, counterintuitive, I think, in our, in our industrialized world to remember that we are exactly commensurate with nature. We are, we are nature acting, just as a plant is nature acting, etc. And your talk is of integration. Your talk is of connection, even when it comes to the subjects that you learn or the places that you put yourself in to learn your, your consumptive practices, your relationship with your, with your partner and your family, it's integrative. It, it, it prizes that kind of organic, constantly changing, fluid, dynamic, mm -hmm. adaptive mm -hmm. uh, sort, sort of um, dynamic. And I guess I just want to, after that long sort of foray into my prescriptions for society, <laughs> just want to ask you, um, beyond the, the, the sort of the science, the, the botany, the biology of, of growing a good garden, what, what's happening inside of us? What is the, the mental health, the emotional health experience that we're getting from engagement with nature? Well, that's a loaded question. I know. I, I tend to ask them on this, but feel, um, I mean, make use of the space, yeah. plant it, and water it, <laughs> right? harvest it. So, okay, there's about 20 things that I need to respond to that <laughs> you just said. First, just going back a little bit, uh, you said that you've just started to become aware of this and, you know, that you're not anywhere close to solving it. And the whole idea for me about lifelong learning is that there's no such thing as solving it. And that's my approach to gardening mm -hmm. also. That's my approach to life. That's my approach to growing. Because I believe that what we actually need, you might need to ask me specifically a question again because I'm about to respond sure. to your long foray. Fire, fire away it? and I'll, I'll bring it back at some point. Um, the thing that we need more than anything as a species is resilience and for me the way I operate in the garden and the way I push into the unknown and the edges of the unknown which is what the mentoring aspect is about and I'll talk more about that after is that resilience is what we need because like I said before and I'm not the first person to say this the only thing that's certain is change mm -hmm. is certain and you know, a lot of people were really rattled when their life was disrupted by COVID of not going to work and not having their things and not having their groceries and not having... I have to be really honest with you and say that in the middle of the city, we were quite insulated mm -hmm. and in, in a very privileged but very intentionally created resiliency bubble that that we created and community is an essence of everything that's happening with how we operate because the resilience that we need involves communities and people have this I'm going to have my own vacuum cleaner. I'm going to have my own car. I'm going to have my own Netflix account. I'm going to live in my own one bedroom apartment. Everyone needs to do everything on their own. Mm -hmm. And 
I think that there's a real vulnerability involved with that. So if we if we emphasize community and building community and nurturing community, I think that is going to be building the resilience into us that we need. So we were not isolated when we had COVID happen because, I mean, there was that initial time where you really were not supposed to see anybody. <coughs> Sorry. But we met outside and schools didn't happen, but socialization needed to happen. I have a single child who was like seven years old yeah. at home. And yeah, we're great parents, but I mean, she needed kids around. And so we, we already had relationships that we tended and we just continued to tend them to say, hey, let's go for a walk in the ravine. Let's go for a distance walk in the ravine. And Let's be more intentional about what it is that we're doing so that there's some kind of learning and growth that's happening as we're exploring relationship together and our relationship in nature. And we really took advantage of that time. And uh, yeah, this is going to touch on so, so many other subjects, but um, I'm not sure which one to talk about first. Anyways, the, the idea of that it just goes on like the learning just goes on and if you continue to learn and not I I guess if your if your perspective is I'm going to be finished school and then I'm going to go and get this job and then I'm going to be this all-powerful person in my job and then I just don't have to do anything else I can just go to work I can come home and watch Netflix I can you know I'll have kids or I won't or I'll get a dog or I won't and that that it, that's just so limiting and and then it also makes that isolation really really emphasize that isolation individually but also as a society as a species how isolated we are and if you look back at the history of our species our connection to natural resources was mandatory yeah it's, it's so we, fun. I was just thinking could, exactly that. We could not operate if we didn't work as a community to know when and how to harvest and harness the natural resources available to us to provide for us. So our nervous systems have been made with our with humans being in relationship to Ex, like outside environments, not sitting in front of a microphone at a table on a wheelie chair. Yeah. So I I think that that is so innate in us that it's really doesn't take a lot to be able to tap into it, and it's something that we're really really missing, and and that that's the part that's like the building the resilience into us. So I did feel a lot more resilient through the pandemic than other people may have. And I really expanded my reach to open the garden to people to come and be able to have that community, that connection. We were working safely outdoors with distance and working with plants. And so many people would have been really isolated and without that lifeline. Quite right. And I mean, I'm I'm, I think, a good example of somebody who was looking for that type of connection, mm. um, a way to safely re-engage with, with people who uh, were interested in holistic health and interested in getting a little bit more in touch with the basic terms of their life. And I found you on Good Work. Uh, mm. Shout out to goodwork.ca. Maybe, maybe one day we'll get a sponsorship from them or something, but we use them an awful lot for finding volunteer uh, experiences for our students, and I end up using them a fair bit myself for, for the same reason. And I found you. Yeah. Thank, thank goodness. Thank goodness. <laughs> yeah. Um, and, and I've begun in just in the past year working with you and, and, and our students in, the, in your homestead, I begin to appreciate some of the things you're describing there, especially this idea that, as you rightly say, it's taken about you know, less than 300 years for us to be completely dispossessed of our, our inheritance right? and, and our inherited knowledge of how to properly interact with and in- integrate ourselves with nature, as you say. Nobody 300 years ago was surviving without, a, from our perspective, a pretty deep appreciation for their place in nature and how nature could provide yeah. um, 
I don't even like to say how nature could provide as though it's an, a, an external entity that's separate mm-hmm. from us, but let's, let's go with it, language being imperfect as it is, how nature could provide for those basic needs, even if we're not even aware of what those basic needs are, right? And that's th- a key. I know. I, so many <laughs> people are not aware of what their basic needs are. So I, I think the things that our connection to nature and our education through our experiences in nature can give us are things that I really emphasize in the mentoring program. So connection to ourselves, to each other, to our environment, which is just like what I talked about, the reflection and and how much that can teach us. Belonging, knowledge, ease in our body, in our flow of living, and reciprocity. You feel like you're giving something, you're receiving something. And those are big empty gaps if you don't have those things in your life. And if you're not investing in them and you're not putting anything out, you're not going to be getting anything back in return. And so you and your phone screen are just not creating any of those things in a really embodied way. It's interesting because you're talking about holistic health and holistic living and you know, in Brazil, they don't call them, they just call them nuts. <laughs> <laughs> so, I, I take your point. Yeah. So it's just, I, I feel like there is this, it's not that I'm an all or nothing person, but when I want to go into something, I want to go really deeply into something. And I, I feel like my whole life is like that. So it's very submersive, like, yeah, I don't feel like there's a separation. It's not like I'm practicing a holistic, healthy way of living. Right. I'm living a life that's very integrated with my values and what my family needs and what I need, what my community needs, what gifts I have to offer to the world and trying to make that whole picture of how can I be in integrity with all of that and not have this divide where like I keep talking about you go into a classroom you go out to work you go to this place and I'm not dissing classroom learning there is definitely a time and place for that but it needs to be supplemented with other things yeah well but in keeping with your description I think it needs to be a a much more fluid dynamic and I don't want to say circuitous but um a a cyclical process whereby instruction is regularly paired with experience and experimentation and observation and then return to a bit more instruction but to have instruction hold the the primacy of place that it does as though it is the best and and in some cases the only way to learn and not perhaps you know a a small starting point for the actual learning process which as you've said is always connected with our life's values, mm-hmm. our life's experiences, right? The things that we actually feel and mm-hmm. need. That's that's what the brain's going to retain, Yeah. right? And so you may not be dissing classrooms, but I, I come pretty darn close on a regular basis. And I think in a perfect world, most people w- would admit that they'd rather see their kids running around in a forest than, than sitting in a chair for two hours at a time. Well, and it doesn't have to be all at this that's edge right. or all at that edge. I think there is... Um, If our cities operated as hundreds of little communities that then could cooperate with each other, it would be, and I think there's a lot of this already going on, especially Mm -hmm. in Toronto. I'm a big part of what that is. But I don't think that that's the MO for how our cities are run. And I'm, I mean, I'm not an urban planner, but I am a community builder Mm -hmm. and I, I do see the results of what happens when people feel included and people find a purpose and people find belonging and what it is that that can do for them and then how that ripples out into the rest of their lives. So if people come to our garden to learn, to be in that space, if they think that they're coming to learn about how to grow broccoli, but what's actually happening are all of these other big movements that I keep saying these words. And then that confidence building and that that peace inside of yourself, that knowing of yourself, 
can make you clearer about what it is that you need to do and what it is you want to do so that then you can go and bring your gift to the world and offer something instead of just eh. yeah well, just it, meh I'm not really excited about my life eh I just you know I do this thing and I think that there's a lot of that going on here yeah and, and people don't even know necessarily what it is that they want or who it is that they are because they're not asking those questions because they're taking so much in all the time mm -hmm. and that's the value of being in nature is when you're taking that in there's this reciprocity because you get to become part of what it is that's happening if you're watching a tv show you can identify with the characters and feel emotionally moved but you don't become part of it in the same way you know what i mean totally yeah yeah i'm, I'm glad you mentioned reciprocity that's exactly the the lens that I see this through, um, Robin Wall Kimmerer and, and mm -hmm. braiding sweetgrass was, was huge for me yeah. in terms of defining the difference between transactionalism and reciprocity as two different forms of relationship. Yeah. I'm, I'm so glad you said in Brazil, they just call them nuts. I'm going to use that metaphor from, from now on. But in regards to the idea that I, I have regularly used the term holistic health as distinct from quote unquote health, at least for the past several years as an educator. And now you've got me thinking about what can I do to maybe make that, make the rationale behind that distinction clearer or, and hopefully head towards not having to use the term holistic health anymore. I, ju I do want to provide some defense of the term and, and maybe you'll agree or disagree with this, but when I say health in a Western context, mm. what people understand by that term isn't what I'm talking about. Exactly. What, what I'm, when I say health, I'm really thinking about a lot of the things that you're talking you're about. You're talking but, about a fuller wellness and a purpose of living and a, a that's vitality right. of life that is beyond the mechanical functions of your body. That's right. But beyond yeah. transactionalism, beyond mm -hmm. telling my body, I'm going to put this many grams of protein in it and you're going to give me muscles or mm -hmm. I'm going to spend this much money on my gym membership. I'm going to go lift heavy things up, put them back down on the ground in front of a big mirror and a bunch of other sexy people. And that's going to make me healthy, right? I'm going to drink this $400 a month subscription supplement. That's what health is. Those are transactions, mm -hmm. right? And, and broader than that, we have a transactional relationship with our society. You talk about um, mm. how much healthier we'd be if we sort of modeled ourselves on, on a more early um, human organization, the tribe structure, right? Small communities right? Of, of, of mutual deep knowing and deep care, building resilience. In, in places where that isn't happening, in my mind, it's because we've been taught that society is not something we are, are a part of, but rather something like a great store of resources and, and intentions that we need to game or negotiate with or trick or buy from in order to get what, what, what we need in our little caves. So we go into society in order to secure our resources, and maybe even sometimes those resources include friendship or whatever, and then we retreat back into our property, what is ours. That's not reciprocity. It's not health. I'm going to keep saying holistic health until the word health doesn't continue to associate with a bunch of meatheads with volleyball shoulders and six packs who are going to. Yeah. And, you know. and I don't know that the volleyball players and the six packs are, is the only perspective of health, but it, there's no problem with the words and it is helpful to have terms to explain mm -hmm. things. You want to know what organic farming is. You want to know about different ways of growing things and different perspectives. And people have said, well, why do we have to call this or organic food? Like, Shouldn't the other stuff be called not organic food? Great point. Um, yeah, it is helpful. I'm just saying, I'm uh, just bringing a point. Yeah. I'm being I'm more smart yes, and, and, Yeah. And, and it, yeah. And there is this proliferation of terms that goes alongside, I, I think, newer or, or at least new to me, um, forms of engagement with nature. We talk about uh, biodiversity, uh, organic, non-GMO designations. Um, and then you're, of course, practicing permaculture in a homestead. Can you, can you just talk about what those phrases, what those terms mean to you? Uh, when, when I first encountered your, your advertisement on, on Good Work, it was uh, permaculture homesteading that I was getting into. I was excited by that. Um, again, having read Kimmerer and, and being just sort of beginning to be familiar. What, what is permaculture and, and, and what are you doing on the, the Wild by Nature homestead? Good questions, and uh, I will try and answer them individually. So 
permaculture, well, actually, maybe we'll talk about the homestead first. The homestead, for me, is, it's an idea. It's a, it's a relationship. Everything, for me, is about a relationship. Mm-hmm. And <clears throat> it is about trying to be not independent and live off the grid, but to, to be as mindful as I can about what it is that we take in and seeing how much of that can I create on our own with whatever we find. Mm. So it doesn't mean going and buying expensive equipment and, you know, making huge construction projects that are very expensive for me to be able to then do it in this method. It's, it's quite the opposite. So our homestead is very, it's very inventive. It's, <clears throat> it's very resourceful. And it, and it is a lot about managing resources. Mm-hmm. It's about making what you can with what you can, with what you've got or what you can easily find and making as much of it as you can. And then also considering what do I actually need? And I think that was a huge question for people at the beginning of COVID because stores were actually closed and things were no longer available. Mm -hmm. And then people started to question, can I live without that? Do I need to have that? Even now, years later, how people go to coffee shops or go to movie theaters and how they consume has changed. People are still ordering groceries online. There's a lot of things that are not happening the way they used to, and I think that people are reconsidering the way they consume. Yeah. And so the homestead for me is a, a mindful approach to what we need, what resources we need, and how many of those resources can we provide for ourselves. Can, can I just throw out some examples of exactly what you've described that I've seen at your homestead? And th- oh, yes, This please. is some stuff we highlight for our students. I, I've, mm-hmm. got, I've got my tour guide yeah. spiel pretty much uh, nailed down now because I've, I've brought yeah. maybe 10 different small groups uh, to the garden. And the first thing that you always asked me to do was can you take them through and just kind of show them what has been meaningful to you? Yeah, I uh, think after like the third tour that I gave, I was like, Mike, this is, yeah. you, you got this. Yeah, <laughs> and I love starting them out with that because it's so important that when we walk immediately into the garden, they see that these aren't just above ground planters. These are above ground planters that were handmade by Maria and her, and her partner and her family out of um, reused pallet wood, right, that you found on a construction site near your home. Yeah, they delivered it to us. They de- yeah. Even better, right? Um, <laughs> That's permaculture. Uh, the we, we helped to tear down an old patio and then rebuild a sort of greenhouse um, patio in your space so that you could do kind of year-round uh, herbology and, and, and all that magic stuff that you do. Um, that was largely made out of reclaimed wood, and mm-hmm. I remember helping David uh, move mm-hmm. some of that around the backyard. You've got a, a fireplace, a beautiful fireplace for people to gather around, as you've described, um, made out of the, the reclaimed uh, basin of a washing machine. Yeah. Right. The fire pit. That's right. The yep. fire pit. And and I could go on, but example after example, the cover, the the squirrel covers that we put over the garden, um, these are they they were all reclaimed. They weren't they weren't got, you know Amazon ordered, um, and and they work perfectly. They work perfectly well. Right? But they and work it, as well as they need to. Yeah. And and then we build resilience into everything that we're doing. Oh, there's so many things to talk about right here. <laughs> okay, so thanks for giving those examples. Uh, the essence of how permaculture goes into our garden is that you take, you integrate the elements into a functional relationship. So there's snow fencing that somebody had wrapped around straw bales that the, nobody picked up after they were on the toboggan hills and everything was closed down at COVID. I took the straw bales, I put them in the garden. I used the plastic fencing to then make squirrel covers or do. So I'm finding things in my neighborhood when someone's throwing out wood, I'm putting it at the bottom of a garden bed so that it can break down and add moisture and nutrients to the soil that I'm starting to build. And that every time I need something, I try and make it a closed loop and have a relationship with something. Mm. So there isn't, there isn't waste. And I'm trying to make systems that can sustain themselves. And when systems can sustain themselves and they're very resilient to change 
And with our climate change and extreme weather patterns, gardening has become a very unpredictable sport. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and there's a lot of devastating loss for large, large farmers. And we feel the result of that, like when there are no bees to pollinate almonds, and then all of a sudden almonds and almond milk are not available, or when a virus, uh, a sickness comes like avian flu and n knocks out all of the chickens and the birds in, in all of southern Ontario. There's so many vulnerabilities built into our food supply and and our everything supply. And I think COVID really demonstrated that very clearly to people. And there's like this whole movement of what I call COVID gardeners who just woke up to the importance of having some connection to where their food is coming from and doing something about it. And hey, I don't actually need this grass or I could use this pot on my balcony or on my windowsill or... and. So trying to make whatever you can with whatever you ha can is a very permaculture attitude. Making closed loop systems and building resiliency by building self-sufficiency. Me putting straw into the garden and mulching all the garden beds is, is making multiple functions. It's eventually going to break down and feed the soil, but it's also preventing me from having to water so much because it's keeping the moisture in. It's mm. also keeping weeds at bay. So it has multiple functions. Mm. So, and that's what I'm always trying to do with any permaculture perspective that I put into the garden. How, are these plants going to cooperate with each other? Are, is this in the right spot to be able to thrive it, beyond just here's a patch of dirt, I'm going to put some fertilizer or even compost on it. And organic gardening means free of chemicals. It does not mean no waste. It doesn't mean the soil is nourished. It doesn't mean that there are closed loop systems. It mm. doesn't mean that there's resilience built into that. So like you said, monocrop, large, large fields of organic wheat or enormous fields of soybeans and corn, all of those are still monocultures and mostly grains need to be grown like that. So how do we build resilience into that by not depending on that as my sole food source, yeah. right? And diversifying what it is that I eat, what it is that I grow. Growing, I grow hundreds of different varieties mm -hmm. of things so that if, we, if something destroys our broccoli plants, then we've got something else in this brassica family in another area of the garden that we are, you know, we experienced that this year that we'll be able to do. So the the resilience that I, I mean, I, I think that might be my word of the year, mm -hmm. that resilience helps you survive storms. It helps m our garden survive storms and storm of change and just the transitions of things. And I think that that's the key difference of a permaculture attitude toward living. Um, even just, yes, I'm not bad-mouthing organic food I, I still appreciate organic food and but I just think that there's more that you can do mm -hmm. that can be done and it has to there's so many things on a much bigger scale like the way there are so few people growing food for so many people that's a problem yeah and that people are relying on the same 10 food items as all of their calories mm -hmm. is a problem. Mm -hmm. So those sorts of attitudes need to change and permaculture includes diversity. And that diversity is really important in a international school <laughs> or in your life and your neighborhood, yeah. you know, so uh, to build that resilience for you to be able to weather whatever's going to come. I hope this is coming through clearly enough, but just in case it's not the, the notion that resilience is the something like the opposite of isolation yeah exactly you like that so, yeah exactly yeah. and and i think it comes from this attitude of i ask every everything i want to introduce into the garden is this going to help me is this going to help the planet like how is this in a big picture mm. not just i want to eat this so i'm going to do anything i need to 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 get it even if it has to come from across the world and 
people had to be paid slave wages to grow it. I want this now. And even by making the simple act of not eating strawberries in December, <laughs> there's, I mean, that feels like it's not a big deal. Maybe for some people it is, but it's actually a revolutionary thing to do yeah. to just eat with the season of what it is that you're, the, the climate that you're well, growing in. I, I wonder how many people in some senses, myself included, um, are even aware of what their seasonal foods are. You know, like I wonder what, if they know what's being grown locally around them right now. And I wonder who decided that that, that wasn't something that was worth teaching children. You know what I mean? So, yeah, I know, I know. Big uh, but, questions. <laughs> yeah. so I could um, have a whole podcast about kids in school. I think I might just turn this into a podcast uh, yeah. about nothing but the stuff that should be taught in primary school. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Uh, one of the, the things that kind of switched me on as part of my COVID gardening um, genesis uh, was seeing a, a quick TED talk by a fellow named Ron Finley, who's known as the, the garden gangster, or at least mm -hmm. he's self-styled as the garden gangster. Mm -hmm. I really, really liked what he'd, he's been doing in um, some of the lower income areas of Los Angeles, as far as I know, and now spreading uh, his, his met good message across the states. Um, basically, a man who decided my community, the community that he came out of, is so isolated from the sources of our our native food, the food that should be growing in our community, right? Mm -hmm. We're talking about food deserts, right? Places where yeah. people don't even have access to a, a produce stand, right? Yeah. A grocery store and, with a produce and section. And food banks are, are absolute deserts in terms of fresh Yeah. Well, it's, it's fresh what's food. the word for it? Non-perishable, mm -hmm. right? Is what they're, they're offering, which, you know... Uh, we love places like Fort York Food Bank and Scott Mission in the in the local area who are doing the good work of providing free food to, uh, you know, disenfranchised and low-income people. At the same time, how much better would it be if we could offer them food from a garden that, that, that was, you know, next to those places? And so this this fellow, Ron Finley, is basically doing something that you alluded to earlier uh, without permission, as far as I know, from his municipal government. He's reclaiming those stupid little um, boulevards. Yeah, those stretches mm -hmm. of, of lawn that are put next to sidewalks between streets and sidewalks that are, are I guess, meant to be aesthetically pleasing. Um, I know that's that the whole lawn as status symbol is something that we get from like the late 18th century French and Versailles and all of these these places. It's it's meant to show people that you got you got land that you don't need to do anything with, right? That's how well off I am. And leisure. Yeah, yeah. but it, it I mean it's such an outdated and stupid idea. Um, it's wonderful to see guys like him coming along, people like yourself coming along and saying, what can we use this space for? Can we grow something seasonally, locally, and give it to the people who, who are local and need it? Mm -hmm. And then over the course of, a, I think, a fairly, fairly short process, he had a ton of success just with a, f a few local folks who, who really took ownership over these, these little plots, largely without his having done anything to encourage them to do so. They saw the value and they jumped in. Um, and it quickly became something like a mentorship community, right? It was young people, especially mm -hmm. seeing the benefits of not having to go down to the bodega and, and pick up some garbage processed food, but actually being able to go out your front door, walk 20 feet and pick up a nice cucumber or a mm -hmm. nice pepper. Mm -hmm. um, and these people started to be fascinated, like, how can I do more of this? How can, mm -hmm. how can I, you know, integrate this type of growth into my life? And he's become a mentor to a whole community of, of young urban gardeners mentorship strikes me as something that needs to be understood better and needs to proliferate more quickly, especially in our education settings. Mm -hmm. Can you kind of develop the definition of mentorship as you see it? Of course, on, on, on Good Works, you're described as uh, wild by nature, mentoring community, right? Join, join our, our community of mentorship. Mm -hmm. What's that look like? How's it different from a teacher standing up in front of a classroom and instructing? Well, I just want to say that it's so powerful to be able to grow something and then eat it. It is such an incredible feeling to say, wow, I grew this. So, and there is more, there is more than just eating that cucumber because it's really hard to grow a pepper. It, you're, you're not going to get tons of peppers. You're not going to get enough peppers to feed your family mm. and not in a boulevard. But that project is doing something more than just feeding people. He took the steps and took the leap and dared mm -hmm. to do something that didn't fit the way everyone else was doing it. 
And I think that's what's so empowering about what he's doing and why he's become such a great leader. He already was, but why he's become so well followed. That people needed that inspiration to feel like they had the permission to be able to go out of the boundaries of things. And I think it's amazing that he did it with boulevards because they're so boundaried. Mm -hmm. So the difference uh, for mentorship is that there's no agenda. So I'm just fully present in the moment, and it requires you to be fully present in the moment. I get to see what are you interested in? What are you hesitating about? What are you stumped by? What are you terrified by? What are you, like, you know, passionate about? And as I notice these things, then I can help guide you toward the things that are really either going to challenge you and push, I keep saying pushing those edges, because I think mentorship does that, pushes your edges, where I believe a lot of classroom learning, and this is certainly, uh, there's obviously exceptions to this, there are incredible educators out there, but I don't think that the, uh, the initial perspective is, let's see how far we can push everyone's edge in a, in a classroom setting. There is a curriculum, and you teach the curriculum because you've got this idea of all the things that everyone needs to learn, and that's important sometimes. And then I think my excitement about learning and and being a mentor is having people with the hands-on experience and getting to be in relationship with people and really tailor something for you so that I'm facilitating the best environment and the best experiences for you to find your own path of learning and I don't think that can happen in a classroom Hmm. Uh, there's just not enough variety there's not enough change there's not enough stimuli in a classroom to be able to do that and everyone has a different learning method of what works best what inspires the most even even if there's a dozen people out with us everybody there's space for everybody to get what they need Mm -hmm. if i'm paying attention to to where everyone is at and that presence and awareness is really grounding for me it's really satisfying to be in that mentoring position but eventually you get to be in that mentoring position as you're being mentored. And I love that aspect of it because that builds your confidence and that also reinforces your learning for you to be able to help guide somebody else. And that happens a lot in the community when people have become more familiar with the space and more confident with their skills. And I think a big part of mentoring is also about not giving you all the answers all the time, but to encourage your own curiosity, encourage you to question and discover where do you want to go and what could possible solutions be. You know from projects where I said, okay, try building a structure over Mm -hmm. this so that the squirrels don't come. Here are all the materials that are available to you. Go. Yeah. And uh, that was not a comfort zone for you. No. Definitely not. I learned a lot of ways not to make a a squirrel cage. (laughs) I know exactly how not to do um, garden protection now. But there's there's so many other things. Like there's you realizing your potential. There's you connecting to your sensory awareness. Mm. There is you using rational processes. There's so much learning happening there in different ways without a structure. And I think that that is uh, your imagination. And also about... You're, you're nurturing your imagination and you are tending to the natural world, which is then going to have you love the natural world in order for you to tend it for future generations. And I think that's one of the key things that is not happening that really one of the reasons why we, it's so important for us to have younger generation involved in having nature connection is because how are they going to care about and how are they going to even understand other than a climate scientist telling them what it means like they don't know what it means when i'm gardening i know what it means i know what 45 degrees four days in a row means Mm. 
I know how that affects the plants mm-hmm. that I'm growing. And then what's the result going to be when a cold snap comes and I lose all of that crop because we weren't expecting that and we're always hoping for the best. I'm always gardening with hope because that's really all I can do. As, as many skills as I have, I'm not in control of that. And there is something really freeing about trying to orchestrate without controlling. Yeah. I, I don't know if that's come across in the mentoring time that you've had at the garden, but there, it, it's all a ruse, the idea of that I, 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 I have it all under control. I completely do not have it under control. I have a vision. I've got the, the permaculture systems, right? So I have the mechanisms in place to build that resilience so that there is space for things to go wrong yeah. and that the whole thing won't fall apart. Two, two things that I took away, just I'm sure I've taken hundreds away, and as you say, some of those things don't become apparent to us until maybe later in, in the experience. Mm-hmm. But two things immediately that I know I've taken away. Firstly, from observing the adaptive state that you are in immediately upon encountering you as an educator, whether mm-hmm. that's the first time I, I met you or each time I came as an individual in the, in the summer to, to your garden or bringing students there. It wasn't like you had... A, just like you were describing, like a curriculum. You didn't have a sheet in front of you and say, well, it says here that on on September 23rd, we're meant to be doing this, so that we need to check these boxes today, right? You looked around your garden. You looked at the people who were present. You asked what, what they might be capable of, what they enjoy, what they're comfortable with. You asked on that day, in that hour, what is needed here, right? And I'll be honest with you, at first, I was kind of frustrated by that because as you said, as I came yeah. hoping to learn how to grow broccoli, right? Yeah. Like exactly the example that, that you gave. I wanted the the I wanted the straight dope, you know? But you did learn how to grow broccoli. Sure did. Yeah. You just came with a whole other bunch of things that you learned also. That's exactly right. And so I, I, that's really helped, to, I hope, inform my teaching style in the future. Mm-hmm. Like, And I think there's a bravery involved in that. Like it's a lot of, I remember my early days as a teacher, they were my best pl- planned lessons. And as I got better, as I got more comfortable, as I knew my students more, my lessons became more flexible. But in my first year as a teacher, I was walking in with 75 minutes planned for a 45 minute lesson. Right. right? And, and then was, you have to look at your notes and... and- <sighs> And you're what? frustrated by interruptions and like nothing ever goes like that and you think you're getting it wrong when in reality you need to, to loosen the to, space quite a bit. To find your way. Yeah. Adaptability is a huge part of resilience mm. and that word that you, adaptability in teaching and in every scenario of the having no agenda. I do have it. I, the, the agenda I have is to respond to the environment that we're in with the people that arrive on that day. And then to discover what's the best scenario for yeah. that moment. And so there, that adaptability makes for much less disappointment. And again, builds that resilience. Because if you have the adaptability, it's like if you're sitting in a chair all the time and this is the only way you are and you're only sitting in a chair, you just like physically don't have the flexibility to be able to move and respond to the world around you. Something I'm increasingly discovering. Mm. (laughs) So the, the more ways that you learn how to move and how to respond to, I I love the word responsible. It's response able. Like can, are we able to respond to the scenarios that happen around us and how, how can we adapt to them? Because the ability to adapt is going to be the make it or break it thing and for the 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 survival of the fittest idea right it's the same thing with the vegetables and the herbs that we grow same thing with how i manage crisis in my life and if i get stuck and i only have one way of dealing with it what if that way doesn't work then what happens hmm. is my life just supposed to end yeah Right? Yeah. Like, well, I have this isn't a, in the rule book. I have a huge drive to live and continue creating and continue living in relationship and contributing to the world that I live in. So I, that's not an option for me. Like I have to continue to adapt and figure out how to how to keep going. I, I just want to make sure that we really highlight and, and emphasize and draw thought and attention to that definition. I've never heard that before, but I absolutely love that. Responsible is how able are you to respond yeah. in the given moment. Yeah. All right, beautiful. Can I, can I tell you the second thing that, that I took yes. away? So there, there was that, the value of adaptability and, and really the primacy of it as a, as a teaching technique um, or a teaching mode, I guess I'd say. The second was um, 
you you, uh, you mentioned the building of um, varmint cages, right? Like, so these are small structures that you put over a garden that will allow the garden to continue growing freely without the Squirrels intrusions of yeah, our, yep. our furry little friends. Um, you had me doing that while while I was supervising students, yeah. right? And I had students working with me. Yeah. And so I'm used to, and I think most teachers are used to being in settings where at the very least we have subject mastery to lean back on. Yeah. So like, the, and a lot of teachers will draw their main, they'll use that as their main source of authority. I know more than you, right? So I was in these situations all of a sudden where I'm literally working with a student named Ilya, who's an engineering student. He's on an engineering pathway. I'm working with another student named Bo. Great ideas. Yeah. <laughs> who, who's like a, one of our math geniuses. Yeah. Neither of those fields is, is, is in my strong suit. I could write you a great essay about, <laughs> about building a squirrel cage, but I'm not an engineer and I'm not a mathematician and I'm working with 16, 17 year olds who are. And the source of authority flipped. And it was all of a sudden, both of us, not as teacher student, not as, you know, the master slave dialectic. It was peers. It was peership. It was, it was something like friendship. Right, if I, if I may, and we're sharing ideas and we're testing stuff out and we're laughing at our failures. And I loved the reason I took this away was because I genuinely felt something different when I knew that the student was no longer looking at me as an expert, but as a, a, a person, mm -hmm. as a human. They saw, oh, this guy, he's just like me. He doesn't he doesn't know everything. Right. He's he's not completely in control. And there's a lot more fun and a lot more growth when that's the case. I loved getting to be people with my students mm -hmm. and it was thanks to you and it was thanks to that setting and it's hopefully something I'm able to replicate in the rest of my life. That is such a beautiful story. Thank you yeah. for telling me that. Yeah. Thank I, you. I all, all credit to you. remember that moment and didn't realize that that was as impactful as it was, but it's a really good point. Mm -hmm. um, and that the, the mentoring model and working in community and working alongside lets that happen because there are so many things that our students can teach us. Yeah. I mean, I'm humbled every day by what my 10-year-old daughter teaches me. And aren't I supposed to be the one, right? But I mean, she's, she's constantly teaching me mm -hmm. how to be a better person, how to be more patient, how to, how to support better. <laughs> it's, yeah, it's amazing if we're open to it. Yeah. That's I'm taking so much away from, from these experiences, and I know our students have as well. We've brought maybe, I think collectively about 20 or 30 students to, to Wild by Nature over the course of the past growing season. And they regularly report that as, as one of their most memorable moments here at Braemar. We want the feelings that, that I have in that experience. We want the, the learning and the feelings that they're getting uh, out there in, the, in, in the, the more popular, let's say the more normal education space. In a perfect world, what role, what place do you see for gardening in school? That's really a complicated answer because the way our schools are operating now has a summer break which is peak growing season and there are so many creative ways of how we can do things but if you think back to when humans were more connected to providing what they needed and to the natural resources available to us kids only went to school in the fall and the winter yeah they didn't go to school in the spring and the summer because they were learning and working and being part of their ecosystem during the season when they needed to be providing their sustenance for the rest of the fall and the winter in countries like ours where we have a deep freeze. So I think that there's a, a real challenge with how schools are run right now and also because like I mean what the schedule is, what the schedule of parents is mm -hmm. nine to five Monday to Friday if that's I, I'm not sure what the statistics are of how many people are actually still doing that but I know there's a lot yeah. that that doesn't really allow for the parents to have a nature connection or for them to be encouraging that in their kids I find it really challenging to have the same school start time in the winter as we do in may yeah our circadian because rhythms aren't the same absolutely like, not like the biggest thing that like my speed and my production changes with the season and that is directly in relation to the cycles and me living in close relationship with my environment mm -hmm. so that i have to be at the same speed at the same time and be putting out just as much 
in December and January and, you know, lunch packed out her at school at the same time for her also. Like there's much less in us to give because she lives those rhythms with me in our family. So we sleep more. We have more candlelight. We do a lot of slowing down things and we can include those things in our family because of the way I've structured our lifestyle and our life and our that my life and my work aren't separated. They are all part of the same picture. So I have that spaciousness. I don't know how that's going to happen unless there was a massive shift in flexibility. And I think part of that has started with people being able to work at home instead of having to go in to certain places at certain times and having more flexibility. But there's no simple answer of how to incorporate learning. I just think there needs to be more supplemental learning Mm -hmm. um i'm not the person to restructure our whole way of being in the education system and how our it's okay just give me the ideas and i'll do it oh okay (laughs) so um you just go ahead and do that so i'll report could could you make our education system and our whole like working nine to five system operate with our season it's in progress give me a couple of years okay a couple of years because the challenge with that is that everybody on the planet is living in a different season so how when we are so international and we're not living so locally then that's causing problems because everyone wants to be on 24 hours a day to be able to communicate overseas or even, you yeah. know, just to California. Yeah. Um, Fortunately, uh, I think I don't need to start by solving uh, that issue. I, I, the, the solution, such as it is, begins with, with me, what's going on in, in my body, what's always. going on in my immediate setting, always. and the people who are closest to, to connected to me. So if I can keep sharing values like this, if I can keep encouraging these conversations, if I can keep subtly throwing shade at classroom learning. And of course, the, the nice thing about all these changes starting with me is that they also start with you and they start with every single one of our students and, and, and everyone that, that we touch, right? It's always starting with us again and again. And when it's a reciprocal relationship, I get to take the idea of, of failure right, out of the mix, as you said, right? I'm not building a perfect system. I'm building a resilient system, right? And it may not be tomorrow, and I don't have to feel like it's a failure if I don't get there tomorrow. Um, I do, however, want to make sure that I'm doing everything I can to, to put the students who are in my care in settings and in, in, in positions to, to access these kinds of values and this kind of learning experience. Do you, do you have any advice for the students, whether they're in a progressive um, you know, g- garden central or holistic health centric um, education system, or maybe a more traditional, um, you know, a big box with with a bunch of smaller boxes in it setting. Mm. Advice for young people who may want to start integrating some of this the, this learning into their lives, and maybe just adopting a different mode of being through it. That's a great question, and I don't think they need to go into a garden. They mm. just need to start to ask questions about how are they part of their local ecosystem, and to ask questions like what excites me, and what is close to me, like physically close to me in proximity. It could be a sidewalk crack with a dandelion. It could be a local park. It could be that you have a plant in your house. And what can you do to schedule, like what does your schedule allow for you to do with consistency? And you need to emphasize relationship relationship to place, maybe relationship to someone who has a green space or likes to go into green space. So I think if you start to ask these questions, they start to direct you into a place for you to find that right fit Hmm. of what you need rather than this is how it should look or how it could look for everyone. As I'm saying, I, I think it's very effective to have individual solutions to all of these and then individually as we all make that impact and connection with ourselves in relationship to our ecosystems that then we'll be able to have this collective momentum Hmm. of us being more connected and also hopefully we're building in the relationship someplace but a very simple technique is called sit spot and so you can just it would be ideal that you could go outside But if you can do it from your window and just look outside if you have to do it. But 
try and do it with consistency every day. And you don't have to be um, rigid about it. The idea is to also have joy in there. So, you know, you don't want to reinforce it, but try and find the way to make space for it consistently. And all you do is you make that spot. It might be on the front step of your house, or it might be in a park or in your backyard or wherever it is, something that has a tree, a blade of something living, something that is of the natural world. And you just sit there and you observe what's happening. And as you do that, you start to, you continue to do that day after day after day. And you form a relationship with that place and you start to notice things that you would never have noticed. And I can't emphasize enough, it doesn't matter what the spot is. You just need to have, even if it's the absolute concrete surrounding, the air is your natural environment mm. you know the sky is your natural environment yeah. and then just notice what it is there that reflection and awareness exercise will start to inform you about what it is that you want to do how it is you're feeling where it is you want to go and then you've just made a nature connection and a connection to yourself so that's a very simple simple way that's accessible to everybody that I would suggest and we try we try to do this in a in a deeper more embellished way by having the mentoring program at wild by nature that you got to be part of mm -hmm. and all your students got to benefit from we got to benefit from you and your students being there that the mentoring program works that with consistency and flexibility so we have three times a week where we meet you can come to whichever ones work for you, as many or as few, as long as you commit to that you're going to be there at least three times a month. And we run for seven months for the season, from mm -hmm. April to November. So in that process of living through the season and continuing to have relationship with the same garden space and come to the Wild by Nature homestead, you start to learn things and have a relationship not just with the people but with the plants and the natural environment and you see how the nettles have grown and now they've really gone past and now they're seeding and you know you get to learn cycles and see things that you'd never have yeah. recognized otherwise <clears throat> for <clears throat> whether they're they're here with us locally or, or overseas i'm sure at, at this point people are going to be curious to be able to to follow the progress of this homestead I, it, it's it's eight years in but the if, if i know you the way i think i do it's going to continue to evolve um oh. and I'm, I'm for one i'm excited to see how those willow trees in the back left corner continue to build that beautiful door frame for your your fairy garden for your daughter and you, you mentioned the nettles <clears> and <throat> i can i can see them in my head where they are and what's going to happen with them next year um where can people continue to engage with wild by nature i, I also want to make sure um you've just started producing and and uh selling these teas and, and a few other products. You have a, a, an emergency kit, I think, or a healthcare emergency first, first kit, first aid, aid kit, kit. Yep. Um, some balms, some, some hygiene products, and some wonderful teas. Myself and my partner both swear by these at this point. You've done wonders for, for my uh, respiratory health especially. Um, yeah, coming back, how, how can folks keep track of Wild by Nature and see all the cool stuff that you're doing? So lots of things. I just want to mention that the herbal products that we're making are a direct result and necessity of the mentoring program. In order for us to have enough process for us to learn in the garden, we have to grow way more than just my family needs. Mm -hmm. And so we have this excess. And then with that surplus, we turn it into things which then the turning of like turning the herbs into things, into remedies and teas and skincare products, that's something that you get to learn. And then that's also our outreach. So that's a real permaculture attitude, right? So nothing's wasted and, and it's feeding multiple, multiple reasons and multiple functions at mm -hmm. the same time. So th all of our uh, herbal products are available at the Evergreen Garden Market at the Brickworks in Toronto um, in their gift shop year round and I will be at a farmer's market again I'm not sure when yet or what but you'd be able to find out by going to my website wbnbotanicals.com and I'm really analog 
I, I really spend so much time outside that I try to not be on social media and doing things. And there are, this year we experimented with one of our um, mentees was really excited about working on social media for us. So we were on social media a lot more on Instagram. It's wildbynature.to. Um, and that's really it. That, like there's only those two places because we're, we're really a word of mouth and experiencing in person. So <clears throat> through the website, you could sign up for our mailing list and I will be in touch uh, four or five times a year to let you know when things are happening, when workshops are happening. We're going to have a whole series of herbal workshops this season because that's really my passion. Mm. And everything from growing and harvesting and processing and making magic with the herbs, um, that's going to happen this year in the new enclosed deck space that you helped build last year. And yeah, and the mentoring program is a larger commitment. It's the seven months. And yeah, and then you can experience us by imbibing the herbal goodness. I couldn't mm-hmm. recommend them enough. Honestly, it, it is something like magic when you when you drink these teas. Um, I know my, my partner was suffering from from a serious bout of a kind of just a nasty cold um, a couple months ago, and you recommended the I want to say the breathe. Don't promote it. Tree. It's sold out. Okay, well <laughs> that's that's how good it is. But you know, sage, ginger stem, red clover, echinacea flowers, oregano, chickweed, thyme, and mullein does the trick. No, no lie. Um, and we're super excited to, to get our students back in the garden with you as soon as possible. It's spring fast approaching. Um, Maria, thank you so much for being with me today. Just wishing you, uh, you know, all the peace and, and, and the joy that should come with this season of, of slowing down and, and, you know, recovering and, mm-hmm. and, and getting yourself prepared for, for what's coming in the spring. Uh, wishing health and joy to, to your daughter and, and your partner, David. Um, thank you. Can't, can't tell you enough how much your, your homestead has meant to us as educators here in Bremer and to our students and and yeah just can't wait to see how this relationship evolves wow thanks mike i'm i'm glowing inside <laughs> with all of that praise and gratitude i really appreciate all of the presence of you in the garden and your excitement to bring everyone and your commitment to offering these experiences to the kids at Braemar is it's really it's just such a beautiful thing as we've said, I think that's where learning happens. I think yeah. that's not, not just where learning, but community and, and resilience and safety and belonging yeah. happen. And if we're not after that for our students, what are we after? And I'm glad to know you want to come back this season because yes, we ma'am. haven't had that discussion. So that's wonderful. Something to follow up on. Yeah. Folks, it's been another episode of the Braemar Life Skills Academy podcast. Thanks again to Maria. Looking forward to you joining us again real soon. Be sure to tune in again next week. I'll be joined by Julie Tomei and Leslie McHugh, who will be telling us about the work they're doing at Toronto's Royal Ontario Museum.